We've got something completely different now. Thank you very much, Brian, by the way. We have here Denise Ryan, who um, works with RMIT and also is a writer, a journalist with The Age. You might have read some of her articles. And look, she's very interested in a program that aims to keep vulnerable students at school called the Hands-On uh, Hands Learning. And she's going to tell us a bit about it. And then she's briefly going to interview Angela Pollard, you'll know, who's the principal of Mount Eliza Secondary College. So please welcome Denise and Angela to the stage. Thank you very much. Hello there. Some of you have met, have met me um, on my journey around the state school system, uh, writing stories over the last six years. Um, I've been a journalist with The Age for 20 years, eight of those writing about education. For the last six years, I've been putting out with a colleague the education and higher education pages and website. And uh, I recently left The Age only a few weeks ago and I'm now working as a lecturer at RMIT University, uh, continuing my work at Melbourne University, training African community leaders in dealing with the media. Um, they're trying obviously to help particularly Sudanese youth um, and uh, better portray those young people. And as well, in the spirit of lifelong learning, I've un I am undertaking a PhD at Monash University. I was a, high, a state high school teacher in my 20s, so life has turned full circle and I'm back in education. What I'd like to say to you, looking back on the six years where I had the privilege of getting into every, virtually every independent school and seeing all the bells and whistles and getting into your school hopefully uh, and seeing a lot of really dynamic teaching happening, I kept coming across a program and it uh, made me laugh in the end because Russell Kerr, a Frankston High School teacher, and his enthusiastic sidekicks, Lisa and Richard, kept emailing me, like every year nine teacher in the state, saying they had a great program. Now, my email inbox looks like your email inbox, but probably multiplied by five because people want you to come down and have a look. Eventually, I did go and have a look, and I have to say this program where um, students are the most at-risk students and probably the most difficult students or withdrawn students uh, can spend a day or so a week working with a teacher with pastoral care abilities and with um, a tradesman or perhaps several tradesmen doing projects within the school, hands-on tangible projects in the school or in the community was often the only reason that these children cited to me that they were coming to school. Now, we write a story like that and we're done and dusted, but I got a big feedback to that story. And then um, I'm busy working on the higher education pages. So I'm interviewing people in TAFE, and the TAFEs are always wheeling out their success stories to me. And I'm interviewing these young men and women and they say, oh, well, I only really, I mean, I was really shocking at school. I was big trouble. But because I did this program, I kind of turned up for that one day a week and made do the other four days. And um, it got me to TAFE. And now, you know, I might get a job. Um, and then, of course, I'm writing up research from places like uh, Melbourne University. So we've got Professor Stephen Lamb, his research on school retention and I laughed because in there again was hands-on learning. So I started teasing Russell, who I'd got to know, go, you know, you've got no marketing budget, how are you pulling this off? And it was simple really, it was outcomes. So what I would say to you is just have a look at this program. But really the best person to talk about it is someone who has actually worked with it. So I'd like to call up now Angela Pollard. Angela is the principal of Mount Eliza Secondary College but she was previously the principal of McClelland College in Frankston, and that program has been running there since 2010. So she's a person who really understands how this program works. Angela. So like you, I have uh, written about or know of many alternative education programs. A lot of them are not in school-based. What distinguishes, in your view, 
hands-on learning from those 41 others that get partial funding, very small amounts. Okay. Well, look, I really have to start by responding to my environment and what Richard said this morning. And I hope that <clears throat> the fact that we've got five minutes for this conversation doesn't represent a weak view of the value of government education. And I hope that you, like me, are feeling pretty angry about the impact of the private system, but also of our uh, collegiate government schools who feel compelled to become pseudo-private schools on the work that we're trying to do for the system. Hands-on learning is an example of a strategy that addresses that social issue, social equity, horizontal aspect of the graph that Richard talked about. What sets the program apart, I think, are three things. First of all, it is completely contextualised in the school setting. At no time do the students ever consider that they do not belong to the school. They are not sent out to do a program where they're fixed and then brought back into the school with the hope that something's going to change. Everything that happens in the program is part of the school and it's part of the school culture. The second difference is the consequence of that and that is that it relates straight back into the classroom. So while the focus of the hands-on learning program, one day a week for the students, is very much in the social domain, addressing social equity, again as Richard spoke to us about this morning, with a focus on personal and interpersonal development, the reason for doing that is to assist students to be more effective in the classroom. So there is no disconnect whatsoever between the program and our focus in schools as principals on improving student outcomes. The third thing that I think is outstanding about the program is that inevitably the students who are involved in hands-on learning are already connected to a huge range of outside support agencies, not just them but their families. So they're probably already working with the Department of Human Services or Child First or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, whatever it might be. All of those people without the program are working in isolation. Once hands-on learning kicks in for those students, those people have a common focus point and it's a real example of how we can work collaboratively with a range of services outside of the school. The other most important person who's on the outside without the hands-on learning program is the family. And again, the parents of these children typically are the people that will not come near the school. They've probably had a negative experience themselves. Hands-on learning enables them to connect with the school because the program is simply about their own child and they do engage with the school in a way that is quite mind-blowing. At McClelland College, the turn-up rate for family events, pizza nights and whatever with the hands-on learning students was about five times the turn-up rate for any other student in the school. So it, it is quite a unique program. And how do, you, how do you actually know that it works? I mean, can you give us examples of individual students or...? Yeah, look, I can talk about the data, I can talk about improved retention, improved attendance, improved student attitudes to school survey data. Uh, I can talk about individual students. I can tell you about somebody like Chris who started school in Year 7 and had no social skills and spent most of his life underneath a table which he would then pick up and throw at anybody who came near him. After two years in hands-on learning, he is now a mentor for other students in the program. He talks the talk about um, managing impulsivity. His mother works at the school constantly going on camps and excursions. She's become a, a pseudo mum for some of the other students in the program. Or I can talk about someone like Alyssa, who was not a behaviour problem, but she's one of what I would call the invisible children. In class, at school, every day, miserably unhappy, no social contacts, um, just invisible. And after the program, a couple of years for her, she emerged with a passion for the environment and ended up in Year 12 as the environmental captain. So they're two specific examples. But if I'm honest and you're sitting there as a principal, it's easy to trot out individual examples. The thing that matters is the impact the program has on the entire school. It stamps the school as a caring community that really puts into action the talk about student wellbeing. And it undoubtedly has a positive impact on every single child in the school because these, stu these students who are not engaging in the classroom get in the way of teacher, teacher work. 
by giving them a strategy to re-engage, you're not just benefiting them, you're benefiting everybody in the school. Now there are 24 schools that are actually running this program, but when I would speak to other state secondary schools about the program, they would often say to me, I'd love to run it, but the school council, which is stacked with the parents of all the achieving kids, wants to uh, put on a VCE teacher in French, and that's all we've got money for. They don't really want to spend the money on a um, tradesman and perhaps some pastoral care for those kids that maybe it might suit us better if they left anyway. People have said that to me, obviously being frank about the uh, difficult decisions they are making about how they spend their funding. So how did you um, manage to achieve, or did you just back the program because you felt it was the most important priority? It was certainly an important priority and there's probably not a principal sitting here who wouldn't say that their school goals were around student well-being, student achievement, retention and good pathways. That, that's, that's the core of our work. And I would also say, and I've said this to the people from Hands On Learning, I don't see myself as someone that's particularly welfare driven, that's not my focus. My focus has always been on achievement, curriculum, student learning. But I could see really clearly that one could not happen without the other. And the reality that's been absolutely laid bare from Richard this morning is that what we're dealing with in our schools is a complex mix of students and not the mix that we would want. So we can't put our head in the sand and ignore the reality. If we want to support our high achieving students to achieve, the first thing we all know we have to do is create an orderly environment. This is a strategy that assists in the creation of an orderly environment. That's step number one. On a simple level, if you want 40 students involved in hands-on learning, it'll cost you about $100,000. That is not a huge amount of money in a budget. I know I've come from a school that just came out of deficit when we took on hands-on learning. It's a matter of prioritising. If it matters to you, you'll find a way. Um, there are lots of things that happen in schools that are not necessarily having a positive impact on outcomes. If you brutally scrutinise what you're doing, you will find a way to find the money. But the money is not just for the benefit of the kids in the program. It absolutely has an impact right across the whole school. It badges your school as a school that actions the talk about personalising learning and it totally sets up an environment in the classroom where learning is valued as is high achievement. And I, I can talk to you about the, the journey at McClellan College over five years where the school started and where it well, hasn't ended but where, when I've left it, where we got to and I absolutely contrib uh, attribute hands-on learning as one of the strategies that resulted in looking after our students, every single one of them, and not being happy to have them walk out the door, but also improving outcomes at the top end. Um, thank you very much, Angela. We're conscious of the time. Craig Felstead from uh, the College Director of Sale College has also, the, some rural schools have really benefited from this program. He had things he wanted to say. I won't get to those today, but if you go to the Hands-On Learning website, you'll be able to read Craig's experience of uh, the program. So you've got a metropolitan and a rural response to, from people who have really tried to use the program and have, are now you know, obviously assessing the outcomes. So thank you very much. Look again, another fabulous and dare I say it, inspirational option for us to keep strengthening and enabling our students to be the best they can be. Look, we're